even just teaching them how to handle transactions with currency. A lot of the women had never dealt with physical money before. Welcome to Mindful Businesses presented by Sarani. I'm your host, Vidya Iyer. In our podcast, we bring to you brands which are mindful in their practices and processes. A mindful business adopts and employs sustainable social, economic, and environmental practices. We have with us Laura Greer, co-founder and global artisan curator of Indiana Hats. Laura joins us from her well-deserved vacation in Italy. Welcome, Laura. Thank you so much. A little bit about Andean Hats. Andean Hats was created to empower women, help support global artisans to continue their vanishing crafts and enable them to support themselves and lead their communities out of poverty. Laura, you have a co-founder who was unable to join us, Pat Krzyzak. Um, tell me how you met Pat and how you both started Andiana. Well, yeah, we had met each other over the years. I've been uh, photographing for National Geographic's artisan catalog called Novika over the last 10 years. And so my travels and my work have taken me down to Peru frequently. And uh, through a friend in Peru, I met Pats, and she also works in travel tourism in Peru. And she also started another sustainable company um, making face oils out of the Andean um, – I'm sorry, out of the Peruvian Amazon. And so we were just chatting one day on a hike through the Rainbow Mountains in Peru. And we realized that we had all the skills necessary to start a business based in Peru, but also in Los Angeles, and that we could share some of the amazing artisan goods from the Sacred Valley of Peru with the rest of the world. And we decided to go ahead and do it. Why hats? You know, there are a lot of unique things. And what is the reason that you picked the hats? Well, I I sort of have an obsession with hats I have for a long time. I actually have a nickname called the Indiana Jones of travel photography. I'm always wearing a hat. I'm always doing adventures. And when I was traveling through the Rainbow Mountains and trekking with Pats, um, we were going through the villages and the Quechua villages up in the Sacred Valley in the mountains And every village has its own special, unique hat. And in Peruvian culture, the Quechua culture, um, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's just they adopted so many hat styles from the Europeans, Spaniards, and the British, and and they've kind of added their own Quechua flavor to them. So as we were hiking, I was it was like I was going through the most amazing hat shop (laughs) in the mountains, (laughs) and and I kept on stopping and taking pictures of all these women. And our guide was laughing about it. And he, he said to Pat, he goes, your girlfriend is obsessed with hats. She's like, you understand. She's like Indiana Jones. And I said, more like Andiana Jones, you know, because we're hiking in the Andes mountains. And then that's how we both were like, wow, that'd be a great name for a hat company. <laughs> that's how it happened. So tell me what exactly Indiana Hats does. You have a very unique business model, a combination of tourism and e-commerce. Would you yeah. like to explain that further? Yes. I would love to. Um, for me, all of my passions have kind of been around traveling, whether it's my photography or empowering women. Um, and through working with National Geographic, I've been exposed to artisans that are doing what they like to call vanishing crafts, which are you know, cultural traditions that would be lost over the centuries if they weren't passed on th- from generation to generation. So they're trying to preserve that by giving a, you know, a global marketplace to some of these artisans that are in really, really remote places in the world. We're talking like the long neck tribe in Burma that does a certain weaving or ancient flute maker in Bali, or there's all these different amazing artisans that I've been exposed to. So I've really loved the idea of almost discovering these living treasures, you know, and I've always wanted to be sort of a treasure hunter in my life. And then Pat's my business partner is really, really passionate about textiles. She's been working in the fashion industry for a while. She's uh, been living in Peru for, I think, seven years now. She uh, started a business down there exporting face oils from the Amazon. And she also works for uh, Delphine, which is a luxury uh, tour operator company, uh, mainly in the Amazon jungle. So between our skill sets, we were just really, really interested in Peru as a region in general and all the different beautiful textiles and artisans that are there, um, our language skills of speaking Spanish, but also just our love of fashion and empowering women. And since the the weaving tradition is passed down 
through the women in the Quechua culture. It was sort of a like a touch point. Our business was sort of a touch point in all the things that we love to do from fashion to travel to sustainability, uh, empowering women. It was sort of a like a win-win for everyone. So you partnered with nonprofit in Oyen Taitambo in the Sacred Valley in Peru. I think it's called Awamaki. Tell me about your partnership with them. Awamaki is a fantastic nonprofit. And it was funny because when Pats and I decided to start a business, we were very much um, wanting to start a for-profit business. We wanted to show that it is possible to do good and be a for-profit business at the same time. But what we did quickly realize was that sort of logistical nightmare it is to um, do business with women that are, you know, they're speaking a, an ancient language that isn't written as oral or it's woven Quechua, you know, they don't, they don't have access to computers and the internet. And so just placing an order and getting the hats somehow from their villages to a place where we could ship them out was, you know, sort of, a very, the most difficult part about our business. So we knew that we needed to have someone there on the ground managing it. And Awamaki is already based in the Sacred Valley and they work with um, multiple communities of Quechua women doing exactly what they're doing with our business, which they are basically being like an agent or a broker for, with these women that they've built a relationship with and that they build programs for and that they live near and they hike to their village and they're partnering and connecting them with businesses where they're weaving can earn them money. And uh, so we're not the only business that is, uh, you, you know, hiring, working with together these women to make weavings for us. I know that the little market, Lauren Conrad's company is using them to do like knitted baby clothing. And, and um, I know that they also make clothing for Awamaki themselves. Um, they have a store in the sacred Valley. So it's really amazing that the, the nonprofit has been, almost like our Quechua um, translator. And they've also been, you know, the, like able to like have us build trust with the women because they have built a relationship. You can't just be a tourist and just hike up into this village. Um, it, it, it's very remote and, and you don't really have the access. So they provide the access. They also make sure that um, it's part of fair trade where the women set their own uh salaries and their own hours and they have flexibility and freedom to like keep their lifestyles and maintain their lifestyles the way that they always have. And Awamaki is very protective of that. So it's really a fantastic partnership to have somebody there on the ground that knows the women um, and can, you know, help be our liaison between them. So do they have co-ops? How did you bring together these artisans or do they just sit in their homes and they do make these crafts in their pair, spare time or do they all belong to a co-op, uh, which then they sell to Awamaki or, you know, or Awamaki reaches out to them? It's sort of a mixture of a few things. Like before we started working with them, um, you know, some of the women were just weaving at home and hiking down to the local market and selling, you know, once or twice a week. Their husbands were guides at Machu Picchu. Um, They're really just living off the land. Um, Awamaki has gone in and created, uh, I think they work with like 13 different communities of women, all sort of within a, an hour, hour and a half, you know, radius of them. And um, they are definitely giving them like global marketplaces to sell their goods in multiple places. And like, they don't always go, they try to spread it amongst all the women. So we, because we're a small business and we just started, we, we are working with one particular community and we like, we know which weavers we're working with. But some of the companies that are larger, they actually spread the work out amongst the women um, and give them all work. So it's not just, you know, two women benefiting from something. It's like 60 or, or 100 women benefiting. Um, and then all of the, like, we all pay into the women's programs. So they have health care and they'll have uh, confidence building and quality control seminars and, um, you know, even just teaching them how to handle transactions with currency. A lot of the women had never dealt with physical money before. So um, it's really amazing that the programs that Awamaki has created to make them, you know, ready to be their own business owners and, and hopefully training them like beyond working for our business, like down the road, they are now starting their own business and they have the freedom to work with whomever they please. So it's really training them like confidence building and how to be an entrepreneur. 
So tell me about how Novika features into this. Novika is the marketplace where they um, give a platform to uh, the crafts which are dying, with the, which are... So how does Novika and Avamaki and Andiana Hats, how do you guys all coordinate? They all seem to be different parts of the same puzzle, but how do you all work together? Well, for me, you know, Navika and National Geographic's catalog, I, I've had a relationship with them uh, for 10 years. And what they do is they work directly with artisans. They have uh, artisans that have, they're responsible to get their crafts to their headquarters in Lima, Peru, if they want to be a part of the market. And they have to be approved. They have to be, you know, um, doing what they have like five different badges. One's like eco friendly or empowering women or, um, sus- you know, sustainable or uh, they have different badges that the artisans have to prove they're doing one, at least one of those things in order to be an accepted artisan by Nat Geo and Navika. But the problem with why they had never carried women's hats before was because of the logistics were really difficult. Um, the, the Quechua women don't have access to bring their goods to the Lima office. And so when I was meeting these incredible women and photographing them, I had asked Navika directly and said, if I could get these hats to you, would you sell them? Would you have these women as artisans in your catalog? And they said, yes. So that became the first part of the puzzle where I was like, okay, I can get these hats in their catalog, but I now have to figure out how to get the hats to the Lima office. And then that was how, after some research, and I have to give Pat's credit for that because Pat's was the one who, who first reached out to Awamaki. But um, they you know, we basically knew that we needed somebody on the ground that could go in and place orders and, and ship it to Lima. And so that was where Awamaki came into the puzzle. Next, going on to your design aspects of your product, there seems to be a sense of spirituality. Is it because it comes from the Sacred Valley, the whole, the two things, the intention bands and the Chakan, the Andean cross? Is that how you say it? The Chak- Chakana. Chakana, sorry. Yes. Yes, the Andean cross. Yes. Well, we knew that we wanted the hats to be different. We want them, you know, what is the reason that we're shipping them all the way from Peru to Los Angeles and worldwide? What makes this hat different? And for me, what makes Peru and the Sacred Valley different is how spiritual it is, the energy that's there that's really just tangible, but it's really the Quechua people and their culture and everything they do is about Pachamama, which is Mother Earth and giving back and giving homage to the land. And, um, and so it kind of just all fell together organically because when we were there and trying to decide the the designs that we wanted on our hats, we were asking the women, what does this mean? And what is this design? And we started realizing that everything they did had a purpose and an intention, like every color they used and every band and the meanings and how it all had to do about the nature and the gods around them. And so we just really felt like we needed to include that and make that part of the hat. That was what was so energetically special about our hats. Every Indiana hat comes with a band, which is hand woven by the artisans and you call them intentions and they have Quechua names. Could you tell us a little bit about the role of fabrics and textiles in the Indian culture and why do you have these bands as part of your um, accessory um, to the hats? Textiles in the Andean communities, the Quechua culture, are very important because the Quechua language, the ancient Inca language, is actually woven or oral. It is not a written language. And so these traditions and these designs have been passed down for hundreds of years. So we thought it was very important to include different textile designs in all of our hats. And we wanted each of them to have a specific meaning. So we hand chose them and gave all of our intention bands different Quechua names. And the idea is that the customer can decide which intention they want to wear or bring into their their day, and they can mix and match them on their hat. So for example, we have seven different intentions. One of them is called Munai, which in Quechua means love. And it's the first pattern that a mother teaches her daughter to weave since the weaving is passed down through the women in their culture. 
And then there's one called Sasha, which is connection. And it's an image of the branches of the tree of life, which they believe connects the three spiritual realms through the branches in heaven and the trunk in earth and the roots into the underworld. There's another one that is called Apu, and it's the symbol of the mountain. And Apu in Quechua can either mean God, it can mean mountain, it can mean strength or power. And it's really interesting word because they really do believe that the mountains are the closest things to gods on earth because they are the closest things to touching the heaven. So every single one of these designs really encompassed the spirituality and the beliefs of the Quechua people passed down the actual designs of the Inca culture. And we felt that it was the key to making our hats really authentic and really Andean. And talk about the Andean cross. Um, the that Shikana. has a lot of uh, the Shikana, yes. I love... It has a lot of meaning to the and Indian people. It the source of uh, spirituality and uh, positive energy. Talk about that. Yeah, so I love the Shikana. We decided to create a brooch for the hat. And so here we have these hats and we have these Quechua meanings that are the intention band that you can, the idea with the intention bands is that you can mix and match them on your hat. So you could actually buy one hat and buy all seven of our intention bands that you can mix and match and decide to choose a different intention every day you wear it. But then we thought, well, we want to activate that intention. We want to, we want to like infuse it with the energy of, of the person that's wearing it in their daily life into the sacred valley. So the Shikana in the Incan culture um, is it actually means bridge and it belie- they believe that it bridges the worlds like the different spiritual worlds and so we thought that's a perfect uh, symbol for bridging the person who's wearing the hat to the culture that's making the hat but, but then we took it a step further the shikana brooch we had it cut from the aragonite stone in the sacred valley which is the energetic property of that stone is to ground you into the earth's energy. And so that was really powerful, but the shape of the Shikana is equally as powerful because it is, if you're staring at it or looking at it, it looks sort of like a chunky cross. It, it's every side has three steps, like a three stepped pyramid, all of their ruins like Machu Picchu and different ruins in um, the Inca like empire all had the three steps because they believed in past, present, future, um, the heavens, earth, and the underworld. They believed in um, the different steps, basically, of spirituality. And then if you look at the Shikana, it has a hole through it. And that hole is the portal to the unknown. They they believe that there are multiple dimensions happening at the same time and that you could travel through to them. And so that portal represents the sun god, but it also represents the unknown dimensions. And then um, a lot of times when you see a Shikana drawn on paper, you'll see a triangle um, drawn on the inside of it. And that represents Pachamama or Mother Earth. So basically, when the Spaniards came over in the 1600s um, and they were forced to sort of believe in Christianity, the Quechua people designed a crucifix that could still maintain all of their gods that they believed in, but in the shape of a cross. And so it was sort of a way to, to combine the religions in a way that was authentic to them. So how do you communicate the importance of these symbols to your customers so that they wear them with respect and understand the spiritual meaning that they come along with? Well, on our website, we really try to do a good job of explaining everything. But as you know, people have the attention span of just, you know, like, flipping through things on their cell phones. So um, what we like to do is we try to have pop-ups and spaces where people can actually physically, tangibly try on hats and mix and match the bands and make it very personal for them. Um, You know, not everyone is physically able to do that, but we always try to explain when they buy a hat, like what the meaning is behind the band that comes on the hat and um, how, how you can mix and match it, or even ask our customers, we'll pull them, you know, what would be an intention that you would want to bring into your life? Like give us ideas for future bands we can create. Um, but we definitely, uh, try to really, really explain like the, what makes our hat so special is that you can choose your own intention and wear your intention. Um, but we, 
when we're in person, we actually let people choose their Shikana stone. We have a, like a large bowl with all the cut stones in it. And we ask people to choose which stone to activate their band and activate their hat as they're checking out. And we found that's been really, really powerful because people, it's like the stone chooses them. And so obviously when somebody buys it online, we, we gift them the stone and we put it on there. But when you have that, that experience in person, it, we found that that's been their favorite part was, was choosing their intention and really thinking hard when they activated their band. I'd like to talk about the challenges that you faced in coming this far with your brand. Um, and was there one particular challenge that, that transformed the brand for you or was a turning point for Indiana ads? Oh my gosh. It's funny because like some of the things that are really hard for other brands have been really easy for us in terms of like having a story and being authentic and like what makes you different. And like, there's so many companies that spend thousands of dollars on marketing and like trying to rebrand and trying to do all this stuff. And that was the easiest part for us because it was just this organic story that came out and, and there's so much meaning already behind everything these women do and meeting behind why Pats and I even started the business. That, that that part's been easy. And I'm a photographer, so like shooting the images has been easy. But the hardest part has been logistics. Like both Pats and I you know, understand that, you know, um, there's a fine line between, you know, uh, like overwhelming the, the women. Like we can't just all of a sudden get like 50,000 orders in and place them no matter how popular we get because the whole point is to empower these women and give them a business and not stress them out. So there's sort of, um, we're learning that we have to grow sort of at a certain speed that is comfortable for everyone. And there's a lot of bumps along the road in terms of, you know, uh, let's say there's a strike in the sacred Valley or there's a holiday or something's going on where like right now it's extra humid because it's winter. So it takes twice as long for the hats to, to dry. And this is our first time learning this because we, we're not even a year old. So all of a sudden our orders are taking twice as long to make because the hats are taking twice as long to dry because of the climate there. And there's just things like that we're learning as we go and we have to kind of adjust for. So I would say that the biggest problems have been just like having a, a timeline that's consistent and having, um, you know, shipping and customs that's consistent too. It's just been, you know, we're definitely still learning the best way to go, like, and guess what our trajectory is and what our, you know, like how many hats should we have made ahead of time to make up for, you know, lags and order times like that we're having right now. So basically logistics and supply chain. Totally. It's been like the biggest challenge. Yeah. So where do you see yourself in five years um, growing from different indigenous communities um, from Peru to other areas? Yeah. I mean, our next step that we're really excited about is launching our women's retreat and just trips in general. We are offering day and weekend trips to go meet the women and learn how to weave and stay overnight with them. And everybody gets a hat that goes on that trip. Um, but we're also doing like a nine day uh, retreat between the sacred Valley and the Amazon to visit, uh, the two different communities that Pat's and I work with, with our businesses. And so we're really excited about that because both of us are in the travel space and that's sort of, you know, the hats are, are almost a vehicle to even add sustainable travel into Indiana umbrella. Um, but then my work with National Geographic and their artisans around the world, like, you know, gives me the access to many other amazing weaving artisans and other countries and continents that we would love to eventually branch out to like the hats will always be made with alpaca wool in Peru, but we'd love to in- introduce intention bands, even if they're just for a limited time from other cultures, just to have, you know, to be able to benefit outside of Peru as well. So one thing that um, I saw on your website was a size range you carry. I have a really, I'm <laughs> sorry, I never find a hat that fits me. It's either too big <laughs> or too small. And you actually had three sizes. So uh, that could be a challenge too, in terms of um, uh, the, supp- the supply chain and logistics. How many do you carry? So you do um, have about three sizes, don't you? We do. Right now, we have small, medium, large. We actually have four, and certain hats we have extra small as well, and certain hats we have extra large as well. So we actually have a wide 
range of sizes. And that has been also a challenge that we face because um, that was one thing that we had to figure out were, were sizes that fit, like certain hat sizes were slightly different um, between the different styles. And also just even if you put a woven band on the hat, it cinches the hat a little bit. And sometimes one weaver weaves tighter than the other weaver. So the one hat might be cinched a little tighter than the other. So we um, to try to basically like let people know that there might be like half size variants in the hats and that, um, and that we do also have those like foam stickers. Like if somebody has a small, but they really want an extra small or it's not quite, you know, you can also get those, um, foam spacers that a lot of hat companies have. And so we've been including those as well, just to give people a little extra, um, leeway in their hat, because sometimes you wear your hair up, you wear your hair down, you want it to be tight or not. And sometimes one intention bands woven tighter than the other. So there, that, that is something that we've been playing around with, um, how to handle, but it is, it's, it's slightly, it's slightly different and everything's handmade too. So even though they're made on a sized wooden dowel that, that these women have created, it's still, you know, it, it, it is still a handmade product. Thank you, Laura, for sharing your passion with our listeners and wishing you an exciting journey ahead. Our listeners can find these handmade hats at indianahats.com. If you're a creator of a mindful brand and would like to recommend a mindful brand to be featured on our show, send us a message on our Facebook or Instagram page. This episode was mixed at Sounds Like Soma in South Philly by Zach Hani. Tatum Gale composed the music for this podcast. This is Mindful Businesses with Vidya Ayya.